response to objections of this type, Kuhn moderated his incommensurability thesis somewhat. He insisted that even if two paradigms were incommensurable, that did not mean it was impossible to compare them with each other. It only made comparison more difficult. Partial translation between different paradigms could be achieved, Kuhn argued, so the proponents of old and new paradigms could communicate to some extent. They would not always be talking past each other entirely. But Kuhn continued to maintain that fully objective choice between paradigms was impossible. For in addition to the incommensurability deriving from the lack of a common language, there is also what he called incommensurability of standards. This is the idea that proponents of different paradigms may disagree about the standards for evaluating paradigms, about which problems a good paradigm should solve, about what an acceptable solution to those problems would look like, and so on. So, even if they can communicate effectively, they will not be able to reach agreement about whose paradigm is superior. In Kuhn's words, each paradigm will be shown to satisfy the criteria that it dictates for itself and to fall short of a few of those dictated by its opponent. Kuhn's second philosophical argument was based on an idea known as the theory-ladenness of data. To grasp this idea, suppose you are a scientist trying to choose between two conflicting theories. The obvious thing to do is to look for a piece of data that will decide between the two, which is just what traditional philosophy of science recommended. But this will only be possible if there exist data that are suitably independent of the theories, in the sense that a scientist would accept the data whichever of the two theories she believed. As we have seen, the logical positivists believed in the existence of such theory-neutral data, which could provide an objective court of appeal between competing theories. But Kuhn argued that the ideal of theory neutrality is an illusion. Data are invariably contaminated by theoretical assumptions. It is impossible to isolate a set of pure data, which all scientists would accept, irrespective of their theoretical persuasion. The theory-ladenness of data had two important consequences for Kuhn. Firstly, it meant that the issue between competing paradigms could not be resolved by simply appealing to the data or the facts. For what a scientist counts as data or facts will depend on which paradigm she accepts. Perfectly objective choice between two paradigms is therefore impossible. There is no neutral vantage point from which to assess the claims of each. Secondly, the very idea of objective truth is called into question. For to be objectively true, our theories or beliefs must correspond to the facts. But the idea of such a correspondence makes little sense if the facts themselves are infected by our theories. This is why Kuhn was led to the radical view that truth itself is relative to a paradigm. Why did Kuhn think that all data are theory-laden? His writings are not totally clear on this point, but at least two lines of argument are discernible. The first is the idea that perception is heavily conditioned by background beliefs. What we see depends in part on what we believe. So, a trained scientist looking at a sophisticated piece of apparatus in a laboratory will see something different from what a layman sees. For the scientist obviously has many beliefs about the apparatus that the layman lacks. There are a number of psychological experiments that supposedly show that perception is sensitive in this way to background belief, though the correct interpretation of these experiments is a contentious matter. Secondly, scientists' experimental and observational reports are often couched in highly theoretical language. For example, a scientist might report the outcome of an experiment by saying, an electric current is flowing through the copper rod. But this data report is obviously laden with a large amount of theory. It would not be accepted by a scientist who did not hold standard beliefs about electric currents. So it is clearly not theory neutral. 
Philosophers are divided over the merits of these arguments. On the one hand, many agree with Kuhn that pure theory neutrality is an unattainable ideal. The positivist's idea of a class of data statements totally free of theoretical commitment is rejected by most contemporary philosophers, not least because no one has succeeded in saying what such statements would look like. But it is not clear that this compromises the objectivity of paradigm shifts altogether. Suppose, for example, that a Ptolemaic and a Copernican astronomer are engaged in a debate about whose theory is superior. In order for them to debate meaningfully, there needs to be some astronomical data they can agree on. But why should this be a problem? Surely they can agree about the relative position of the Earth and the Moon on successive nights, for example, or the time at which the Sun rises. Obviously, if the Copernican insists on describing the data in a way that presumes the truth of the heliocentric theory, the Ptolemaist will object. But there is no reason why the Copernican should do that. Statements such as, On May 14th, the sun rose at 7.10 a.m. can be agreed on by a scientist whether they believe the geocentric or the heliocentric theory. Such statements may not be totally theory neutral, but they are sufficiently free of theoretical contamination to be acceptable to proponents of both paradigms which is what matters.